Good afternoon, everybody. And in the case of Kate Moss, who's joining us from Sussex evening. Good evening, Kate. Good this evening. <laughs> Where's your glass of wine? It's dry January. What can I say? Oh, dear. Do you right. have that in America? Dry January? I think so. But yeah. we do. Most... We're just not good at it. <laughs> <All right. laughs> most British doctors that I have talked to have, you know, had either a glass of wine or a pint. Well, it's one o'clock here, so I'm drinking boring tea. I wish I was somewhere yeah. more funny. <laughs> so let me introduce today. We are here to discuss a new book, City of Tears, the sequel to The Burning Chambers by British author Kate Moss, who is not the supermodel, but rather a super author. And just to say briefly, she's the number one New York Times and international best-selling author with more than 7 million copies out in 38 languages. I fell in love with her when I read The Labyrinth, which was a huge international bestseller. In addition to The Labyrinth, she's written Sepulchre, The Winner's Ghost, Citadel, The Taxidermist's Daughter, and the first in her 16th century France historical series, The Burning Chambers. So I'm going to confirm, oh, sorry. And our co-host today is Brad Meltzer, who probably needs no introduction to the Poison Pen audience, but nevertheless, he too is the number one bestseller of legal thrillers and has done a wonderful series of historical books aimed largely at a young adult audience about seminal American figures of all colors, persuasions, and cultures, which are fabulous teaching tools as well as reading opportunities for children and in some cases, adults. Actually, Brad, my, my observation recently is that there are many adults who could use your books. <laughs> I can't imagine where you get that idea today in America. <laughs> right. Um, in any case, I'm going to confound you slightly, Brad, by asking Kate to start, and then I will turn this over to you. But I would like her to tell us a little bit about The Burning Chambers, uh, because if it, it's um, the first book. And is it a trilogy, Kate? Is that what you're writing? It's, it's actually four. It's four books now. A tetralogy. A tetralogy or a quartet. But this is only because my maths was so bad. So when I was doing it, my husband said, do you, do you realize, darling, that if it's only three books, everybody will have to live to be 130 years old. And it's not science fiction or fantasy. So I thought, ah, oh, God, it's going to be four. So it's now four books. <laughs> OK. So um, it's so great to be here. I haven't been in the store for a long time, but Barbara, you are a great inspiration and I've not met Brad in the real world. And it's wonderful to be talking to a fellow author because we're all kind of sitting on our own at these desks. I'm doing a world tour for the City of Tears from this desk. Um, so that's been very weird. So in a, in a nutshell, the Burning Chamber series is 300 years of history. It starts on the outbreak of the Wars of Religion in France in 1562, and it finishes in the other, on the other side of the world, 1862, in South Africa. And it's really a Romeo and Juliet story. It's a story between a Catholic girl and a Protestant boy, their marriage, their descendants, the feud between another family. It's a story of missing relics, a missing child, the way that people have to leave their homes in France and flee first to Amsterdam and then to the Canary Islands and then to the New World and South Africa. And the whole idea for the series came when I was on book tour in Franschhoek. I don't know if Brad's ever been to the Franschhoek Book Festival, but it's you've been there. It's just wonderful. And it's this old, it used to be an old frontier town about 30 kilometers east of Cape Town. And I'd never been there before and I was taken into the town and I suddenly started to notice that all the wineries had got French names. And then when we got to the main street, I saw that the main street was Huguenot Street. And so I thought, you know, what is this history? Went to the museum and discovered this incredible bit of, to me, unknown history that the Dutch East India Company had taken, they'd stolen the land um, of South Africa in the Cape. They were using it as a fueling station and they suddenly realized that the land in the Cape was like the land in Southwest France. So they sent a letter back to Amsterdam saying, if there are any winemakers, refugees from the religious wars in France, who are prepared to leave Amsterdam, come to South Africa, start growing vines, we will pay for you on a ship, we will pay for your families, we will pay for a French pastor to administer to your spiritual needs. And seven families sailed. And their names are all written on this board in the museum, every name. 
um, of the people that sailed and arrived there in this frontier land. You know, it's very, it reminds me of all those stories, you know, Willa Cather novels, you know, going into the, the unknown and uh, sort of these huge landscapes. And then I went down the list and I saw the name of a family that I'd written about in my novel Labyrinth. And at that moment I thought, okay, I get this. And I looked up at the mountains and I thought, what if you had grown up your whole life with this mystery at the heart of your life? Like, where does your ancestry come from? Who were your parents? What is this feud between this other family? Why 300 years later are they still chasing you down? And you've heard of this land, this beautiful part of France that you've never seen. You've not been allowed to go and you, were, you had to flee, your family had to flee. And then you see these mountains in South Africa and they look like the mountains you've heard about. And at that moment, I had it. I thought, okay, I can write a refugee story about finding a new world, finding a new home. But then, of course, being me, I had to go right back to the beginning, 1562, when the wars of religion broke up. And it's the story of a girl and a boy and their attempt to be together and keep their family together against incredible and huge history. And that is the end of that. <laughs> four, four books. <laughs> Right. Uh, well, Brad, after that. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll tell you, and this is in, again, um, let me, let me just say for everyone, read the book. It's amazing. <laughs> we have to start by saying that. And you have one of the greatest stories because she didn't do it for herself. Barbara here is one of the greatest booksellers in the country. I know okay. her forever. So thank you to Poison Pen for hosting Kate and myself. Um, but let's talk about this, Kate. Let's, let's jump into it is um, I, obviously we love the setup um, and the setup I love the fact that, you know, when you look at any of your press materials, everything's about this and the Huguenots and this and deep in it, but you just went to the end, it's a boy and it's a girl, yeah. right? The thing that we all latch onto. And then you very cleverly, very beautifully in a way that everyone loves, drape this history all over these kind of basic ideas. So let's just ask, where does that come from? Where does your love of history start? Is it something you're taught? Is it something you pick up or is it something you've, it's always been a part of you? Well, it's, um, this is why it's such a pleasure to talk to you, Brad, because you have this sort of bristling history in your work as well. And I think it's, it's for me, it's two things. It's firstly, we are who we are because of where we've come from. So you know the past and you know where we are now. And we are living in extraordinary times. We all know this, but we also know that people try to use the past as a way to justify the present. So for me, the idea of knowing the truth of it the common sense of history, because particularly in the 16th century where these books start, uh, for example, you'd be hard pressed to find any women that are not queens or mistresses. It's a very, you know, it's a story of that, but the rest of us were there too. So I like the idea of going back into history and telling the story of unheard and underheard women's voices and the men who love them. And the idea that the real history is made by all of us, even if it's the court and the generals and the popes and the imams and the rabbis, you know, it's, it's often a story of court, military, church. Um, but for me, it's about, okay, who would I have been? If I'd been living in Carcassonne in the Southwest of France and like my lead character, Minou, and my father is a bookseller, what, what kind of girl would I have been? Would I have been brave enough to stand up against the soldiers? <laughs> knocking at the door? Would I have been brave enough to stand up for what I believed in? Uh, would I have been brave enough to hide the children that were being, you know, taken away? So it's always that for me about the love of history, knowing where we came from. And I think, you know, novelists are, we're detectives and we're archaeologists if we're looking back in the past. And I like to look at anywhere I am, whether it's southwest of France, Paris is very big and the city of tears and Amsterdam is the city of tears itself and imagine the city that was there beneath my feet. So what would I have seen in the 16th century? And that's where it all comes from. You know, the three pillars for me of all my books are landscape, mystery, and history. And that's the kind of triangle on, on which I work. I love that, but I feel like, I feel like there's two answers in there. Because I love the, I, of course, um, we can find ourselves there. But you also, you have something there that you want to, I always feel like you're trying to teach other people their lessons, um, these wonderful lessons, but you're also searching for yourself, not just to give the lesson out to yeah. others. And is that, because you started by saying we are who we are, but you're still searching. Yeah, still searching. And also I think it's, um, 
I think when we look back in the past and we imagine other people's lives, of course the societal expectations, the way men lived, the way women lived, um, the background of faith, which is in everything in the wars of religion. You know, we all know that religious wars are not about faith, they're about power and influence and, uh, you know, beating the other guy. But beyond that, a world where God was everywhere, if you like. So when I go back into that period of history, what I'm trying to do is create the texture of a world so that a reader can imagine what it felt like to live then and can be, I, I suppose you, you're right, you know, I'm looking for myself in that, I'm looking for what it would have been like to be a young woman, an older woman now, um, living in those times. Because I think the more that we can understand the hearts of the people of the past, the more we understand the hearts of everybody of the present, you know, they're not different from us. They had different expectations, sure. Their, their everyday lives were different, but the human heart doesn't change so very much. And so in the City of Tears at the heart of it, there's a, is a lost child story, which of course is very popular in modern thrillers and detective stories. But what I wanted to do in this is say, you know, a mother and a father's heart break, break then. It wouldn't be any different. They wouldn't still be living the rest of their life as detectives trying to find that child. And that's for me why history matters, you know, that if we can understand the past and we can imagine their love and their jealousy and their fear and their jeopardy and all of those things, then we, we are more tolerant of ourselves now and the people around us. Well, I agree. And, and you said the key words, history matters, which I also remember that I forgot to embarrass our mutual friends. So why history matters is you and I both, we did not figure this out. In, or you probably figured out before I did, but our friend George Lucas, who you know, I think as an agent, yes. I knew as an original editor. Um, I, maybe you had the no, same No, me call. too. I, he was my first editor. Was he your first editor? He acquired you yeah. back in the day, right? And so yeah. I think yes. he said well, you and I were acquired at the exact same moment because my first book came out in 1997. I think yours was 96 or 97 by, by the year, depending That's on where right. it was published. And what I love is, I don't know if you had this moment, but I need to take this moment and embarrass him, is my, back in the answering machine days, uh, there was a message on a machine and it said it was the UK edition. I didn't know. So the, the message when I pushed it said, George Lucas wants to buy your book. Now in America, for a nerd <laughs> like myself, that was the single yeah, greatest yeah, yeah, yeah. answer. I'm like, George <laughs> Lucas is gonna like this is pre the prequels. I'm gonna be with you know Ewoks and Darth Vader and everything. And I met the loveliest, nicest, dearest old friend. Um, so we have to give a shout. History matters to both of us. That's what brought us really. I think we we today. totally do. And and the and George, if he's listening on this call, thank you, George. Not, yeah, because yeah, I remember yelled, firstly. Worry, I know he is. Well, yeah, we're gonna. Yeah, I mean, he's letting us down. But I remember him giving you my, uh, giving me one of your, you, the proof of your very first book as well. And he was very proud of both of us. And I know doing all of that. But I have that same story. And George gets so cross when I tell it. But when I was in New York, I think it was probably Labyrinth Publication, and things were going pretty big, and it was fantastic. And he'd booked a table at that posh restaurant that appears in Sex in the City with the gigantic Buddha in New York City. I, I can't remember what it's called. And somebody in the kitchen had clearly been looking through the, you know, order book and had seen George Lucas and Kate Moss. So oh, when we yes, arrived you're at That's the nice. restaurant, it was hilarious. You know, we arrived at the restaurant and there were loads of paparazzi outside. And we just gently said, you know, I wonder who's in, you know, and then we were shown to this insanely good table. Right. And, and then the after a while brain. it became clear. Yeah, it was the. The, the quiet and polite English people were not the people they were hoping for. Right, but, sure. you know, we had a great meal. <laughs> oh, I love that. Oh, I love this. So this is what I also love. So we talked about how you're finding yourself, but you are using, you are, you are an internal optimist in everything that I've read yes. about you in your books, in, in, the, in the profiles I've read, in, even on the Wikipedia page. Even Wikipedia makes you an optimist. I'm, I'm an optimist as well, which I think is interesting because all we do is read about these horrors, right? But we somehow find that. And I'm just wondering where your sense of optimism that kind of, that fills all these things, where does it come from for you? Well, I, 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 I think that old cliche of whether people are a glass half full or glass half empty is true. And I think you kind of come out like that. But also I had amazing parents um, and had a, a lovely time as a child. And I think that, I, did, I wasn't ever put in a position where things were, were difficult, really. You know, I, I read books, I read 
the Secret Seven and the Famous Five and all the, I'd read all the mystery and those exciting books. And I read Anne of Green Gables, wanted to be Anne of Green Gables. I was obsessed with Laura Ingalls Wilder. You know, I, I, I read all of these stories that had girls with agency at the heart of them, if you like, you know, girls doing stuff. And my lovely dad, who sadly passed on in 2011, um, he used to read me my bedtime stories. And this, you know, I had two younger sisters, so my mother was doing all of the, you know, baby bath time and talcum powder stuff. And my dad was reading me stories, which was fantastic. The only problem was uh, he was a, a gentleman of a certain age. He fought in the Second World War um, and he grew up in the 20s, 1920s and 30s. So he read me the stories that he had liked as a child. So when I was five, my bedtime story was King Solomon's Mines <laughs> by Ryder Haggard, which is fantastic. I mean, there are obviously a lot of stuff now that, you know, is uncomfortable for modern readership, but there's also amazing energy and excitement and proper old fashioned adventure. But there's also a lot of violence and a lot of sex. And my mother, when she discovered this, she sort of whipped the book away. We were, you know, I was never allowed to finish it till I was older. But I think it's it's those kind of things make the difference to you being an optimist, because I think what I learned was in good old fashioned stories. And I write those sort of stories. You write those sort of stories. Barbara does. She fills the shop with fantastic books as well, is that there is resolution and hope in a book, because in the real world, things don't necessarily resolve. They're not necessarily fair. They don't necessarily finish. But on the pages of a novel, um, in the end, there is resolution. In the end, the story comes to an end. And I think that is part of being optimistic. The idea that there is, you create a world, you tell a story, and then you finish and you shut it and you go, okay, I get that. I know how the story finishes. And for me, that is part of optimism as well, is that however out of control things seem, and I write big, you know, I write stories about war and the consequences of war and romance and forbidden love and, and City of Tears, a missing child, you know, and it is a, a mystery at the heart of it. But at the end of the book, there is, there is always hope. There is always the continuing story that people have found the way back to something. So, you know, I think optimism comes from reading, maybe. Maybe that's my short answer. <laughs> yeah, I think, I actually think it's, you know, and I, and I, I I read this whole interview that you gave that I loved, and because um, I have we have similar backgrounds in the sense, very different backgrounds in the sense um, of you know I think where how we grew up. But the one thing we had very much in common, besides that our parents passed away three years apart, um, I, there were odd overlaps, um, not just George Lucas, but was that um, we both felt completely loved, despite every disaster I had that I went through when I was younger. I always had that love was never in doubt. And That's I think right. that that is kind of the core ingredient in the alchemy of optimism. I love this quote though. You gave this quote and I love this. Um, there's a line in the book that says, you're either my friend or my enemy, nothing in between, says one character of the move between Catholics and Huguenots and the silent, silencing of moderate votes. And I love that idea because the burning chambers is, you know, deals with kind of comes out of the time of refugee the refugees, you have a refugee crisis in the book and we're dealing with in reality. This book is obviously this almost crazy idea of, um, it almost seems like, you know, it's untouchable is, is free speech, you know, God forbid that women yeah. should have free speech um, in, and in a polarized society. Now, this is not a coincidence, right? Um, <laughs> there's something I, I always feel like in books, I don't know where, you know, I'm sure you, oh, I'm curious about your process about how you go, but how much of it is I need to, I start the book and I need to answer this and how much of it is, this is just where the world is and I'm just following what I need myself and I'm putting it out in the world. What, what, you know, what, what directs that? I'm kind of, um, I think the really big thing about writing historical fiction, um, even if it has a mystery element as, as my books do, is that it must be 100% set in the time in which it's set. And what I mean by that is that I can't, as a 21st century woman, put 21st century words into my lead character, Minou Joubert's mouth, because she's a woman of the 16th century and a product of those times. So she must be authentically a woman of her time and she must have integrity as a character for that and for her husband, Pete, and all the other characters um, in the book. So I'm very, very, very careful not to put myself in 
and to say, guys, you know, are you noticing that what you can see outside the window on your television screens is happening here in my book? Uh, because then it doesn't work as a novel. But what I do think is that readers bring themselves to the book. And for me, and I don't know if you feel this as well, Brad, the book is finished when it's in a reader's hands. So, you know, I, I've written this. I haven't, even, I haven't even seen the hardback actually yet, Barbara. So I was lovely. I'm pleased to see you've got one. Yeah, it looks lovely. I haven't, it's not arrived in the UK yet. I've got the, um, the ARC. And, um, but for me, I write it and I hand it to you and then the reader finishes the book. So I think that the context in which I'm writing, I started to dream this book because for me, it's always like the whispering in the landscape. That's what it feels like. It always starts with landscape for me. And then that combination of history and the landscape and the mystery of it, the three things. But I started this book thinking of this series in 2010 before a lot of this stuff mm -hmm. was happening. But what it reminds me is, well, two things. Firstly, that history is a pendulum. It's not a straight line. Things sadly just do not get better. We never learn. Um, things go backwards and forwards and then uh, people become complacent and they forget that peace is something to be treasured and kept safe. And then we go backwards and we've been in a time of going backwards at the moment and we'll see where we are on that pendulum swing. But the other thing that I think about um, writing history and that sense of where it comes from is that I... If we can read the stories of people in the 16th century, we take away any of the political stuff that we're surrounded by all of the time. In the end, people are reading about Minou Joubert and her husband, Pete Redon, being forced to leave Paris in the middle of the worst massacre of the wars of religion, the St. Bartholomew's Day massacre, where 3,000 people were slaughtered in the course of a few hours. And then maybe as many as 70,000 people were slaughtered the length and breadth of France in copycat massacres. And they are wealthy, comfortable, successful, senior Huguenots. And it's an ambush and it's a plot. And they leave Paris with only the things they can carry. And if a reader can read that story and can feel for them what that must have been and the loss of family members, they don't all make it out alive, they don't all get to the City of Tears Amsterdam, then I think what historical fiction can do is shine a light on things that matter now, but with the benefit of hindsight, without it being, you know, a, a piece in a newspaper, if you like. Nobody reads my novels to learn the history, even though they are brim full of history. They read them because they want to know what happened. Do they I, find yeah, that? Yeah. I also think people read and love your novels because they want to find out about themselves. Yeah. I think they want to live. They want. They have that feeling of like, who am I in here? Can I do this here? Um, but I do agree. Just to go back, I do believe that the book is only finished when it's read. I believe yeah. that that's that, that again. That I talked about alchemy before, but there's an alchemy there as well. Um, but but interestingly, I I read in in uh, in the introduction to the City of Tears, is you said you didn't know this world as well, which I find completely, <laughs> I don't believe you for one second. I was like, that is such bullshit. Like, there's no way you can write this beautiful, amazing book and these books. You, you, you're telling me you have nothing about this part of history? Well, I didn't before I started, you know. Um, I mean, that's great. Like in America, if I write about the American Revolution, that's kind of built into our core, right? Yeah, I yeah, yeah. I know yeah. all the details, but it's just part of being American, right? We're fed that. But the idea that you came upon this and truly from scratch, that's true? Well, yeah, no, it really is true because I'm, i am you know, I love the medieval world and, and readers listening will, who will have read Labyrinth in particular will know that. And I love the fantasy ecla, the 1890s, that kind of decaying, corrupt moment in Europe. Um, and then that early part of the 20th century. You know, there are certain, I think we've all got periods of history where we kind of, our hearts sing a little when we know that it's that. And, you know, another great uh, historical fiction writer, Walter Scott, who is a staple of English reading. And my, my dad loved Walter Scott, you know, Ivanhoe and all of those things. So I've, I've never thought of myself as, I've never been a Reformation girl. That's the thing. And so when I was in that graveyard in Franschhoek and I felt that, you know, you will have had it, both you, Barbara and Brad, you will have had that prickle at the back of your neck where you think, oh, th there's a story here for me. I tried to resist it. I, I, I really did. At the beginning, I thought, just don't do this, Kate. You don't know anything about 
that the history of South Africa in the 19th century, and that's a minefield anyway. You know nothing about the Reformation in Europe, um, and this isn't your period. The 16th century, yeah, just about, but the 17th, 18th, you know, these are not your your people. <laughs> but there was just this thing, you know. It's like it's like tapping on my head. It's like I know I can write this story of this girl and this boy and their descent. I just knew it, and so, but I still resisted. I did. It wasn't the next thing I did, and. Um, and I'm a carer. Um, I was a caring for my my dad at that stage, and then my mom still was living with us, and she passed away in 2014. And I'm a full time carer for my mother in law, and so I was in a, I was in a position where I could do a lot of research at a desk, but I couldn't travel very much because it's you know for, for all the obvious reasons. So I kept resisting it, and then I was in Amsterdam, and I went to the Amsterdam Museum, and I started to look. I thought I'll just read a little bit about the Huguenots in Amsterdam, just a little bit. And of course, then, you know, hours later, you know that when you find a brilliant history book and you're still reading it, you know, as the lights go out, you know, it was that sort of thing. And then I was on a tour for a different book and I was being taken around by a lovely, lovely guy um, who, who was driving me around. And I started saying, you know, I, I've seen some really interesting things about the Huguenots in Amsterdam. And the next day he arrived and he handed me, I haven't got a, you know, like a piece of paper like this, he just gave me this. And I said, you know, what, what's this? And he said, this is a photocopy from a diary that I have in my family. My family were French refugees. They came to Amsterdam to escape persecution and death. And I thought you'd be interested to read this. And I was like, oh. And then he was called Peter Redon. And then three years later, I gave in and I thought, I'm going to have to do this. I'm just going to have to research the hell out of this and get to learn it. And of course, I gave my lead character his name as a thank you for that generosity, the thing that just pushed me over the line. So then I became obsessed and read. I mean, I've read every book, Brad, seriously. No, I could tell. Well, first of all, I read. I'm still so, I'm, I'm super mad at you because I read that in the middle of all this lockdown, you read not that all the books, you read 250 books while caring for your mother-in-law and you wrote city of tears <laughs> and another book that's coming out like i was so unproductive for the first six months i was just no no no, so, no 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 this is all you know this is all newspapers you know it's like the the city of tears i'd already wait written. wait wait let's clear it 250 <laughs> books did you read that well, i did but they that's were a lot books. you, you no, read no. that's crazy that's 250 <laughs> no, no. books but they were i mean you know this is a tribute to the amazing poison pen uh, apart from anything else i read um, mysteries all mysteries. I, I reread all of my golden age uh, detective stories. So and what'd you, every yeah, what'd you like? What what sat out of the best of that when you go through? Agatha that? Christie, uh, Miss Marple is the most subversive, 100%. amazing woman. Closer. You know, there we are. We are basically twins. You're a little bit younger, but you know, yeah, no, but I've got more hair. Right? So, you know, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, so I read all of those. I read all of Nio Marsh, all of uh, all of the Sue Graftons. I went back and read Josephine Tay, Marjorie Allingham, Dorothy L. Sayers. Um, I, I then, every time I'm on tour anywhere, when I go to a bookshop, Barbara might remember this, I always say, give me um, recommendations for local crime writers so that I can build up a library from where I've been. So, you know, then you get to know. So I've been rereading lots of uh, writers that I only were was introduced to on tour. So I've read, I have read more than 250 detective stories in lockdown, but that's partly like a lot of us, I'm not sleeping, you know. <laughs> okay, you know, I can so, do that, okay. You know, so you can read a book a night, frankly, God, before. Oh my gosh, know. I, I yeah. feel like my reading and, well, I got productive toward the end, but not, but okay, but let me go this. Okay, back to City of Tears. <laughs> Here's this beautiful book, okay. In Locked In Here, there's something you found in your research that you were like, this is the one I can't wait to tell everyone. This is the detail. I know you make up a lot of stuff. I, I could tell as you talk about it, you feel like a historian, even though it's fiction, you feel that need, as you said, to make sure it's authentic, it has to be real. But what's that real detail in there? Not the made up one that you were just like, this is the one from that time period that just made me go, wow, this is the one I can't wait to show a reader. That is, do you know, I've never been asked that question and it's such a lovely question. I'm tempted to say that's a writer's question. Yeah, and it's, I know. Um, yeah. I'm only um, asking you stuff that I want people to ask me, that's it. <laughs> okay, next time I'll return. Next okay. one, I'm Or back. even the thing, For what's you. the thing that you couldn't put in? That's the other writer's question, right? Is like, what, what are you not, what, what, what's, Look, what's the, you know, we have, we don't have to give you. 
there's a high body count in this. Everything's in, you know, it's everything's, all, yeah, yeah, everything's in. Um, there's a lot of murders in this book. Um, well, I, I, it, it's kind of a, a, a two thing. The, the City of Tears goes from 1572, which is 10 years after the Burning Chambers finishes. And there's been this period of three wars and three uneasy periods of peace. And now there is this incredible moment in 1572 where there is a hope that this bitter religious civil war could be brought to an end. And it's brokered, this was a brilliant thing that I learned, by two queens. Catherine de' Medici, the queen mother essentially of the very, very weak king, Charles, and Jeanne d'Albret, who is the queen of Navarre, and her son is Henry of Navarre, the most senior royal Huguenot. And Catherine de' Medici has had two sons who've died on the throne. She's got two more pretty odd sons, and she's got a daughter, Marguerite de Valois, known as Margot. And so these two 1920-year-olds, essentially they are brokered to bring peace to France. And it starts the novel with my family saying, well, look, we've got this invitation to a royal wedding, should we go? And anybody who knows that their history of this period, the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre, will be shrieking, do not go to Paris, <laughs> whatever you do. Um, but of course they go, because otherwise there'd be no novel. And, and I was interested because what I, what I feel about these times is we know the big history, but in the end, it's always the personal stories against the backdrop of the real history. So I wanted to discover what would happen to my family if I took them there. And I didn't know that it was going to be a lost child story until that was how the, the book turned out. So there was this amazing bit about these two queens. And then Jeanne d'Albret arrives in Paris in June. And within a few days, she dies. And then the rumours go round that she's been poisoned by the Queen Mother. And then a set of gloves has been sent round, you see, to her dwellings, and apparently they're poisoned gloves. Nobody will ever know the truth of this. Nobody will ever know the truth of who ordered the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre. Was it Catherine de' Medici? Was it Henry, Duke of Guise, who is the powerful Catholic, who is the lover of the bride? <laughs> or is it the king? Nobody will ever know this. And did they intend for it to get out of hand? Were they just going to wipe out the leadership, which is, you know, would have been a tactical war behavior to do? Or did they intend it to become, you know, destroy Paris, which is essentially what happened. But the thing, so all of that was fascinating to me as I was researching it and then leaving Paris and escaping and going to Amsterdam. But the thing I think that really did my heart good, my optimist's heart good, and it's at the heart of the City of Tears when they have settled in Amsterdam and they are welcomed, is this, that in Amsterdam, that took in a lot of Huguenot refugees and was a Calvinist city, that's simply the name for the Dutch Protestants, and everywhere apart from Amsterdam is turning Protestant, but Amsterdam is still Catholic. And after 40 years of Catholic rule, on the 26th day of May in 1578, the city changes from Catholic hands to Protestant hands and not a single person is killed. And I just loved that because- Oh, you, if we had that, you oh, have me a poison gloves. Yeah, well, I mean, it's, <laughs> it's just, it's just this wonderful thing. Oh, that, that's okay, a beautiful idea, right? It just changes it? and everyone's yeah, safe. Yeah, that's it. It can be done. There can be quiet, safe revolution and they just take all the catholics on barges to the sea and they put them on ships and off they go into exile and that's it and so i loved that when i was in amsterdam i was given a fellowship by the dutch literature foundation and was there for a month to research the book and it's a period of dutch history like you were saying for you guys you have things that are seamed into your dna you know they're sewed under your skin in holland um, it's very, very interesting that that period before the golden age, Dutch people don't study. So I suddenly was in this really strange situation of discovering things, asking my Dutch friends and publishers, what about this? And they go, we don't know about this thing called the alteration. We don't know what happened on that day. Yeah. And, and that was also fun because of course, when I was therefore doing things in, in Holland, um, in Amsterdam, people go, well, what what happened? When did, when did this happen? You go, ah, oh, yeah, well, you know. Right, but now you're solving the mystery of Amsterdam itself, which is even... Well, obviously, no, I've been... <laughs> absolutely. The mystery of Amsterdam itself is just why it's such a great city. Such a cool city. Yeah. Okay, so tell me this. Um, what's better for a novelist to have? Um, the ability to empathize or the ability to observe with complete detachment? 
Ooh. Empathize, I think. I think I was actually, as I asked yeah. you, I'm like, I wonder what my answer <laughs> Yeah, what's your answer? No, I know, I think you're right. Go up, please, please elaborate. You, you hit well, on I mean, head, I think. I, mean, I, I think you have you... to have both in a weird way, yeah, you but, do. but if you don't empathize, then the reader will never. So I think you'd be lost. I mean, I think, I think you have to empathize because I think we read novels to make sense of emotions. We read novels because they enrich our lives. And we read novels because on the pages of a novel, we can stand in other people's shoes. And they're the thing that give the color um, to, to everything, I think. And we've seen, I don't know what figures are like in, a, in the USA, but um, they've just announced in the UK that this has been the best period of book sales for eight years in the UK. And I think that says everything about what all of us do and why we know it matters, that books matter and the truth matters and fiction matters, you know, all of this. But I think you have to be able to empathize because otherwise, particularly in my sort of books where there's a lot of murder and mayhem and um, battles and chases and all of these things, you know, I like things to happen. I like there to be adventure and jeopardy and momentum, but you cannot write good bad characters or bad good characters if you can't empathize because I have an evil priest at the heart of the City of Tears, uh, Vidal, who is setting up his own um, essentially alternative Catholic religion. He is I was super stealing. jealous of the name, by the way. When I saw the name, I'm like, I'm stealing that and using it it's as a book. It's a such great, a great name. name. It's I such know, a good name. such a great name. And every language can say it, you know. It's, uh, it's, it's great. Yeah. I saw it and I was like, oh, I'm <laughs> so jealous. <laughs> It's all right. It's quite a common name in the South of France. So, you know, help uh, yourself. When you see it in my next book, it's totally common. I, I came up yeah. with it myself. As long as, as, long as I get... You actually stole it from Georgette here, you rascal. <laughs> <laughs> I'm curious. Uh, oh, Vidal I thought is, she stole it from Gore Vidal. I was no, like, no. he just seems like he'd have like good Vidal evil is, stuff. Um, it's a really, really common surname. So I get all my names from gravestones. Yeah, so, I saw that. Know, well, the opening yeah. of the book, when you have an opening in a graveyard, I was like, you're taking my next book and you're doing it first. But I, <laughs> I love that too. I didn't care that you were, I mean, I was like, that's what I'm doing. And, and I loved it. It was like right from the moment I had it, you hooked me. Ever heard that Samuel Beckett comment, a uh, wonderful comment, I have a bone to pick with graveyards. Yeah. <laughs> you know, there we are. You know, but it's, you know, so, uh, but the thing, you know, so he he is stealing and making fake relics. And and, and the idea, you know, the heart of that is the idea that if, if people believe that the, it is a true relic, therefore does it have its powers to heal or do all of these things? And, and one of the things that is sidelined that I discovered in that, if there are any um, people listening who are Catholics, what I found fascinating was to discover at this period of history, there were only seven stations of the cross and it was an active decision from the Catholic Church that they should tell a better story. They needed better stations of the cross to go in. So at that moment, then it became 14 stations of the cross. And some of the ones that we think of as being the most, you know, distinctive, I suppose, like the crucifixion or, you know, coming into Jerusalem, they weren't involved in. Anyway, that's a sideline, but this is another thing about research and, and storytelling. But the thing is that I want people, if they're, they're reading that character, at the beginning of the Burning Chambers, Pete, and Vidal are friends. So there must have been something. He can't just be appalling because if he's appalling, then why were they friends? Then, then Pete can't be a, a sensible character either. So I think you always have in all of your characters, you've got to have a nuance and a dark and light. And if you, you can't empathize why somebody might do something, then, then they'll just be two-dimensional villains. You know, they'll be baddies in a kapow biff way. Right. And then why would anybody care? You know, why would a reader care about what happens to them or, or you know, be saying, go on, or you just, just listen to what they've got to say. You know, so you, you want the reader to be on the page going, I can tell you the answer to this. You know, it's right. part of and that I, But I think what you said is right. I think it's interesting, you, you know, as you talk about relics, it almost reminds me of, of novels and, and stories themselves, which is they have a power. They have a power yeah. we give them yeah. as readers, yeah. not as writers, as readers, we, they have a power over us. It, you know, it's amazing. And, and almost what you said at the beginning, it's just, it's just a nice bow to put on this, but um, we're talking about how when something happened, you know, so long ago, it's much easier to see it than it is now, right? Like if we see that, and if I said, you know, giving women power on Twitter today, I, I'd set off a firestorm depending on how I define women, how I did this, how I did that, you may, but if you can see something happen back then, it seems so clear that what's right and wrong when it's in the past, yeah. when we're yeah. removed from that moment. And, and that power that you're given is, I think that's what runs through the city of tears 
you know, from labyrinth all the way now, you know, even going to burning chambers, um, I think is, is, you know, they are, uh, I mean, relics in the best way. They have this power over us and our ability to see. And I think yeah. your readers are very lucky for it. But I have <laughs> to ask you this. Well, Barbara, yeah. I don't know. Are you doing questions in this or are we, oh, can we just? We, well, I, I have a couple of things I want to talk to Kate about either. Okay. You, I'm going I'm to, I have to ask this though. And then I'll, you want me to throw it over to you and then we'll go there. Is that good? Sure. Whatever you want okay, to so do. I have to, so I did read this, Kate. Um, so I read that your book, um, that Labyrinth was the number one selling book in all of the UK for whatever the year was, 2006. Is that right? Do I have that memory? Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So just for a moment, tell me, I just want to know as the writer, like <laughs> what was the pressure? <laughs> what was the pressure after that? Because I know my, when my first book came out, you know, thanks to George and everyone else that took off, the second one plummeted and the pressure between the two was slaughtering to me. It was, it was crushing. So I can't even imagine when it's at that level. So I just want to hear all the horrors of your life so I can take joy in the fact of them when you have such great success. That's really what I'm asking. <laughs> oh my God. It's, um, yeah, no, you, of course. I mean, it, it, was, it was really unexpected. That's the thing. I don't know if you felt that. Oh, no, no, I could never. My, my, family, my parents didn't go to college, four-year colleges. So I didn't ever think I was going to get anywhere. And it's just, it, you know, and the thing I had, the, I had a really weird publishing experience of Labyrinth in that it came out in the UK in hardback and on the 7th of July, 2005, which is in a very, 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 very much smaller way, our 9-11. It's the day that the, all the bombs went off in London. Sure. And I came up from the country where I live and I always walk in London because it's, I prefer to walk, you know. And I, as I walked, I thought, there's a lot of people walking, it's quite weird. Arrived at my publisher for my publication day for a book that I had been dreaming about for 15 years. It was incredibly dear to me. And, when, and everybody just looked horrified to see me. And they were like, how are you here? It was like, it's my publication day. And this was the day before mobile phones. So I, I didn't know anything had happened. So then I spent publication day in my publishers which was a building of glass where everybody had been told to it. go to- Was it a yeah, hotter? Um, it was a Ryan. Okay. I right. was at a Ryan by then. And, um, but they, you know, all those buildings are the same. And so that was very, very extraordinary experience. And so everything that had been planned, of course, nothing matters compared to the loss of life and the first responders and all the things were going on, but it was just a very weird moment. But then the book went into the bestseller list at number 10. And it was because brilliant booksellers were still hand selling, even though this this well, thing had happened. was going on, right? Uh, you know, and I remember my lovely husband laminated the Sunday Times bestseller list with Labyrinth at number 10, because I genuinely felt that is beyond my wildest expectations and I can retire happy now. And that was the moment that felt that people I did not know had <laughs> bought the book. And so then it was, that was amazing anyway. And then the paperback, what happened was that it was in, it was on a television show and it sold after the show, it sold 60,000 copies the next day because it got a great review. They don't tell you what the review is. I was sitting at home with my children who were, you know, nine and six. And I was, it was five in the afternoon. I had an enormous glass of wine that I could barely drink because my hand was shaking. It was so nerve wracking. Not least of all, because my lovely Ma living in the next village had told everybody in the world that I was on the television. And I suddenly thought, oh my God, they're all going to turn on. And they're going to go, this is the worst book. And my mother's never going to be able to go into the butchers again or the post office. Um, and there were signs saying things like, Barbara's daughter on the television tomorrow. You know, it was, it was just <laughs> painful, painful. And then it was okay. And, and then it was the most extraordinary experience so yes it did feel and my second book didn't do as well i mean you know I, i'm not it sure can. Any, but first of all i'm not sure it, ever... slack. it can't right it's impossible <laughs> no. but it, you know it, it did it, i mean it's, it was it did really well in the uk it's still yes. number one and all of those things but not not at that level um but you know every time i felt that i don't know if you did this but i was 45 when labyrinth published i'm nearly 60 now so i was like I was the person I was by the time that overnight success happened. Someone said to me once that whoever you are, when you become famous, that's who you emotionally are the rest of your life. Yeah. 
And I always love that. I don't even know if it's true, but it sounds cool. But it does I sound cool, I, but I, you I were younger, see, you see. You I was, I was young, me. right? I was trapped yeah. in that. But, but the interesting point, like for me, I remember back then um, when it came out on the bestseller list, my, when the first book came out, it was um, fax machine time. So there was no internet. Yeah, that's right. And, it, that's and I didn't even know what the bestseller list was. I truly didn't know. I was like, yeah. they're like, you're on the bestseller list. I'm like, what is that? And I said, yeah. stay by the fax machine. We're going to send you. And, and the book came out. That's it was right. like, it was, it was number eight. And by the way, you should frame in your house at, at number 10. That, that one that your husband laminated, that's yeah, the yeah. best one you want. Because it, It's the best one. Still is. Best one, number eight, number best. <laughs> And, and it came and I looked and it came through and I turned to my, my wife at the time, we had just gotten married and I turned to her and, and, and I said, let the backlash begin. And the oh. moment it came out, we were getting these stellar, wonderful reviews that said it was the best book and everyone loved it. And, you know, in Vanity Fair and Time Magazine and all these silly places. And the next week after it hit the bestseller list, um, Entertainment Weekly gave it a D plus, D oh, like yeah. David. Yeah. And I was like, wow. Now, and in America, at least, we love to pick things up and then we love to knock them yeah, down. Yeah, no, we, okay. we do and, too. And that's okay. But I, for yeah, me, but that, was the, that was the, I expected it. I didn't, I didn't, I never take my, my, my strength or my self-identity from sales, but I just remember going through it and being like, wow, that was, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That was incredible. To but watch. you see, I, I was lucky um, in that, in that, um, because I founded a big literary prize for which celebrates and honors and promotes women yes. uh, called the women's prize for women's fiction. fiction prize. Yes, I saw yeah. That. Um, and that I had been mauled and dragged over the coals so much by the time I published a novel yeah, that, um, that I, it's not that I, I, it's not that I have a thick skin. I, I particularly, it's more that I had learned like, don't believe any of it. Don't take your good reviews and think that they're true and don't take the bad reviews and just stay out of it. And it, again, I think it's that sort of, I felt very grateful for the success of Labyrinth. I absolutely know what you mean, that, that sense of not disappointing people and all the rest of it. And every now and again, someone will say, you know, somebody actually said to me, the City of Tears is doing really, really well. Somebody said, but what does it feel like, you know, you probably never have a book as successful as Labyrinth. Thank and you. I, I'll take this knife thank and you. split my wrist um, with it. Okay. Thanks. But I, I can I can say without a doubt, shadow of a doubt, this is the best book I've written. City oh, of Tears no, well, it, is of easily is the best book I've because written. Because you're feeding yeah. your brain, right? 250 books yeah. shows me one thing. If, if everyone listening learns nothing else about you, yeah. your inquisitive mind is trying to outdo yourself. You can very easily write another version of Labyrinth. You know how to yeah. redo it. You know the you know, the structure, of, but instead you said, I'm going to jump into something completely unknown that I love. And that will always make for the better book because you're the better, you're a better, more. And of course, person. the thing with the, the city of tears that it's, it's exactly the same ingredients as labyrinth, um, you know, because it's, you know, so it's, so the joy for me is because I had to take a break um, from writing historical fiction because I simply couldn't do the on the spot research um, while I while I was being you know carried. But you also wrote another. Can we plug that other book before Barbara yells at me? You have another <laughs> book coming out. Your book about taking care of your mother in law. You are if, if no one knows the other thing that everyone must know is you are a nice person. You have been <laughs> taking care. Your mother in law has been living with you for how many years? Uh, twenty five. Well, I was going to say twenty five. I thought it was twenty five. Twenty five years. Yeah, taking she, care but she, you know, she's great. No, she, no, 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 no. She's only needed taken care of quite recently. No, no. She is, Living with your mother in law oh, yeah, is yeah, the nice yeah. thing, right? Oh, okay. And you're taking care of her. I mean, that is beyond. She, I promise you, she is a hoot. She is a legend. Granny Rosie. Everybody knows I love her as a Granny lot. Rosie. My, uh, my relatives are hoots too. Yeah, I can live and it does make. And she became ago. in in the pandemic. Granny Rosie became a media superstar for a minute. My main job was managing her promotion. She's ninety and in a wheelchair, and she want. We had this thing called clap for carers on a Thursday night, um, which everybody went outside and you know clap for the NHS. Sure, we didn't um, hear. Yeah. yeah, you know, and it was quite lovely. And we live in a you know kind of in the suburbs, so there's there's quite a lot of space, so everybody could come out of their houses and people rattled and Rosie who can play anything by ear on her electric piano but still can't read music you know um she said oh I think I'll I'll go and play so we all took her stuff out into the road and she played all the old wartime classics like we'll meet again and roll out the barrel and she plays away and bangs away and it's fantastic and my daughter filmed her on just oh, on her mobile phone takes. All it takes. And then the next day I had the BBC on the phone saying, we've yes, seen Granny Rosie. Of Rosie. course, of and course. That, that, that's my new job. But so um, anyway, she's- Wait, wait, uh, wait, plug the book. You have the book coming out. When does it come out here? 
Um, I don't know. It's in George's hand. George is sorting that out at the moment. Ah, George, um, George, better make it happen soon. <laughs> We're waiting, George. We're waiting. We are waiting. I mean, you know, it's called an extra pair of hands, and it is a love letter to my mum and my dad, who I loved very much and miss very much, and Granny Rosie, who I've known since I was 15, because my husband and I met when we were at school. And I met that my makes... wife when I was 15, too. There you me. go. I, you everything see... in your bio, I'm like, this is freaking me out. Actually, we are, uh, maybe we are the same person. Maybe we're the girl-boy version of I each other. I haven't seen us in the same room at the same never, time. So. Never, never. You know, and so <laughs> there we are. So, you know, it's, um, but I wanted to write it because I think, um, in all my novels, and City of Tears is no exception, and Burning Chambers, I always have older characters. You and I both share a love for Miss Marple, but I wanted to write the book because I think so much of the language around older people and aging is negative. Yeah. And old people, older people are bloody brilliant. And they've seen stuff and they've done stuff and they are incredible. And of course, there are many challenges about being a carer and, the, and it's often very sad and, and, and difficult because of course the journey is always going to be in one direction of course we understand that but you know um, at the same time I wanted there to be a book about having a brilliant time with a 90 year old and my mum and dad who died in their 80s and I spent a lot of time surrounded by people in their 80s and 90s and let me tell you they they're always good for a laugh you know they, well, you know. Thank you very much, Kate. Cat Patrick's over here just dissolving into <laughs> laughter. Oh, no. I was 80 in December, honey. So. Hey, there you go. Thanks. That's the yeah, purchasing. So, People you know, have got this idea, haven't they, of what when they right. talk about elders and, you know, it's like they forget. And when I was setting up the Women's Prize, I the, the woman who gave me the money um, for the purse that goes to the writers, I, I only spoke to her once. It was always done through lawyers. And she heard me talking on the radio and she said, I'd like to endow your prize. And that was amazing. And when I was first promoting the prize, it was just vicious. And everybody attacked me all the time and said, well, women were rubbish. If they were any good at writing, they wouldn't need a prize. And I obviously hated men. And, you know, it was, it was it, the usual daft. Yes, so the internet. You know, yeah, it's just, you know, thank God we didn't have social media then. And so I did ring her up this what one time. To search for? And I rang her up and said, um, I'm really sorry. I hope you're not feeling that this you've backed the wrong horse, if you like, by giving us this money. We really believe in this. We really believe it will make a difference to women's writing and their voices being heard and being honoured. And also for men and women hearing about great books. And I went into the whole spiel and she stopped me and she said, my dear, we went through much worse than this when we were trying to get the boot. <laughs> mm, that's great. And, you know, you just think, yeah, you know, so so the She's book is the a fight. celebration of of the fact that it doesn't matter how old you are it matters what you are like and what you do and it should be evident but there's a, there's it's always very negative it's always seen as people living older is a problem whereas it should we should be celebrating it's amazing anyway so that comes out in june and it's up to george when it comes out in america I'm really glad you feel that way, Kate. It gives me courage to carry on. <laughs> I, the only thing I have done is I have implored the Poison Pen staff if they feel one day that I truly am past it, they will have to tell me. Because one of the problems with getting to be 80 is that you may not recognize that you don't have the agency that you had at some point. So we have a handshake deal that they will, Very good. they will let me know when we get there, but we're not there yet, let me say. No, uh, meantime, let me ask Patrick if we have any questions or comments from Facebook. You know, they, there have been a few, but during the course of the program, they've, an, they've answered. Can I, oh, and with, can right, I, can I do a final plug? Largely answered them. So I'm going, to do, I'm going to do a product placement moment here because I've been thinking about French Hook in <laughs> South Africa and I will make two observations. One, if you go to South Africa and go to Cape Town, you will recognize that Table Mountain is truly important because it's the fact that it was so obvious from the ocean, you know, sailing by that this was the place. So it was like a gigantic landmark. And, you know, they build a botanical garden, they fed ships and all. But if you go up to the wine country, Kate, and you visit the wineries and you see the French influence and you recognize the vinners. And I'm doing a product placement here because I have never been a fan of rosé wine. I've always thought it was sort of disgusting and pink lemonade. But there is a winery in France called Dahlheim that makes a Pinotech rosé 
that is so fabulous that my husband now imports it for me by the case. <laughs> and so we've, we've retained our, but you can't help but feel, you know, that the centuries connection between the French and, and South Africa. I mean, you know, some people watching this might think that that's a really somewhat far out, you know, attachment. But it's really true that um, that it's, area of South, and it's, it's just above Cape Town. I mean, it's it, like it, a, yeah, it, an it's hour the, drive or something. Um, really is as though you were in, in, you know, Le Midi or part of France. And, and there, there's a sign at the side of the road that says Languedoc, which is the region of France that I, some, you know, in the old days right. lived in as well. Um, and, the th and it is an extraordinary, not completely, but a huge amount of the fact there is a South African wine industry is down to the French Huguenots going there. And it, it is an amazing thing. And the other thing that's very moving when, when you're there on a book tour, when I was launching the Burning Chambers there, we did a big launch at Franschhoek and in Cape Town and, and Johannesburg. But in um, Franschhoek, every event I did, people came up to me afterwards and said, would say, I am a de Villiers. I'm a descendant of those that family or this family. And I found that really moving, that incredible sort of continuity, that sort of silver thread that's gone through these hundreds of years of people and, and still are there and still very, very proud uh, to be of Huguenot descent. And rightly so, I would say. They are amazing. And there's a very strong Huguenot tradition, of course, in the USA, um, in Virginia in particular. And that, you know, I've been talking to quite a lot of, uh, people in the American Huguenot Society and, get, and getting in, information there as well because it's a fascinating story. Different one. It is. I'm going to pass. You, them is she the signed? Link. By the way, just so we mention the people, are you signing uh, books or you're shipping out, Barbara? I know. Well, we actually, I shouldn't say this <clears throat> aloud, but we have imported um, the UK edition, which Kate has signed. That's what I want. Customers. We got a plug. We are we doing, we, have... screw that wine. We want to make sure, buy your book from Barbara. <laughs> Thank you. We do have lovely copies of the um, Minotaur edition here, the St. Martin's edition. It's a beautiful cover. Um, and we haven't even mentioned Carcassonne, which is one of the no, no. few places in France that I have not yet been to that I oh. really love to visit. So I'm living to go to Avignon and, uh, and Carcassonne when we can travel yeah. again. Um, you know, it will all still Brittany, be there. Kate, because I've fallen in love with Brittany thanks to crime fiction. And if you haven't run in France, um, I'm trying to remember uh, Dupin, Inspector Dupin. Yes. Um, and his series, which hilariously is written by yeah. a German executive at Von Holtzbrink, but you yes, he's, actually, <laughs> he's actually French from Brittany. You'd never know that. Anyway, um, Dupin. No, 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 it's not our no no, 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 this no. is Inspector Dupin from the, the Brittany books that PK. Arsene Lupin is. is rather older. Right, and I'm, I yeah. will also say that French television has been absolutely extraordinary, and if nobody has watched Call My Agent, I'm making yeah, he's a watch for Call My Agent, but Arsene Lupin is on, and there's a wonderful series um, called Murder In, which goes all over France, and many of the places Kate writes about, you can see um, every episode is different with different casts and different plots, and some of them, frankly, just suck, but, you know, it's not the point. Uh, as you get to visit all these different parts of France and see what a remarkable country it is, how, how large. And last night we were looking in the mountains in um, Moor, I think it is, and, you know, there's a massif, and, and much of it looks like New Mexico. And more oh, I travel yeah. around the world, the more I've recognized that landscapes are unique, and yet at the same time, they're almost the same. China looks a lot like the highlands. Go down the Yangtze River, you could be in the highlands. If you are in Turkey, in um, you know the interior, you could be in Santa Fe because yeah. they're both calderas and they both have hoodies and they call them fairy chimneys in Turkey. And I think that's one of the great things about this is that you know even though they're different, we're all the same. And yeah. and one of the things that I think people should think about reading the City of Tears is how divided, how absolutely unbridgeable the gap was between these people. And many of them paid a horrible price for it, but eventually history marches on and people march on. So timing, timing is so important. You know, Brad, we're so lucky that we lived in the second half of the 20th century in America. I mean, oh, it, I've read 100%. and I believe it, it was the best time ever, you know, in terms of quality of life and so forth. And then as Kate says, the pendulum swings 
And the first two decades of every century since the 14th century, 15th anyway, have been a disaster. They have really been a disaster. If you think back to it, you know, go back to the First World War, then you go back to the Napoleonic Wars, then you go back to the South Sea bubble and the whole bit with, you know, England and France. And uh, it's just, it always seems like we tear everything apart to start. Well, I, yes, history. you know, as Kate said it so well with the pendulum, I always take Mark Twain who supposedly said, but I don't believe he actually said it, is that history uh, doesn't repeat, but it sure does rhyme. Excellent point. In a very nice way on which to end. So Brad, thank you very much for taking time. I know you have another obligation. Hi, the City of Tears, please, everyone go. Buy from this, right. my, one of my favorite bookstores in the whole country. Kate, what a pleasure, Barbara. You know, we love seeing you both. I have to thank say, you, you. Brad, I, I can honestly say, having done three weeks of stuff, that was the most fun interview I can remember. That's just that was just George, brilliant. That's all. Yeah, yeah, no, well, that, yeah, that was an added bonus, obviously. But no, it's just such a joy talking to another writer. And I admire you enormously and love your work. So right, exactly. uh, right back to you. Love your work. We have one Go. question that just came in, Brad. We have a question <laughs> that just came in. What is your next book and when can we see it? Perfect ending question. Plug away. Oh, I think it's your book. You. <laughs> oh, I was saying for Kate. I was like, oh, Kate, when's the next no, book? No, oh. no, no, this is for you. I'm going to answer first, but then Kate has to end. She, uh, my, I just finished a draft of the sequel to The Escape Artist, but the next book that comes out Ooh. is a children's book. Um, it comes out in March. It's called A New Day, and it's about my first ever fictional children's book. It's about what happens when Sunday quits, and the other days say, well, we need a new day. And so they have tryouts and they have fun day where everything's fun. They have run day where everyone runs. And then they have bun day where everyone wears Princess Leia buns, not the buns you were thinking of. And um, they have to find the new day. So that comes out March 2nd. And then I Am Frida Kahlo comes out in the Ordinary People Change the World series the week after March 8th. And then the sequel to The Escape Artist is coming next year. So I'm oh, that's to hear about The Escape But please, please, yeah, Kate, tell us when's the next one come. I know that oh, yeah, yeah, no, next absolutely. fiction. Yeah, so City of Tears um, out now, um, uh, as Brad has pointed out. Uh, the next one, number three, which will probably be out next year, actually, because, you know, we're, we've kind of slipped a year because of the pandemic. Um, and it, they leave Amsterdam. They are in another wine producing region, which is bizarrely the Canary Islands, which was the one yeah. of the biggest wine producing then. Um, and the num book number three is essentially Lady Pirates on the Ooh, high seas and they arrive in Cape Town at the end of that book. So yeah, lady pirates and swashbuckling because you can't beat a good swashbuckle. Sounds wonderful. <laughs> I'm right, doing it. Everyone. I'm doing it too. Here we are. Barbara, <laughs> thanks. Thanks, Barbara. Thanks, Kate. It's been a Snap. Pleasure. Lovely Thank to see you. you all. Bye. Hello. We hope you're enjoying our programs and podcasts with authors. We'd like to expand them and your help would be appreciated please make a donation at poisonedpenfoundation.org. 100% of the proceeds will go to help connect authors with readers in this difficult time. Thank you.